In the wake of the Ascension, number six, playoffs, round two, we saw Nablime defeated by Hamster. It's time to take a look at Nablime against an upcoming contender, Veek7, who has already signed up for the Ascension number seven qualifier because it has a seven in the name and because we now need qualifiers. If you too want to join, join our Discord server and sign up. And without further ado, let's check out Veek's newest map, or one of his newest maps, Fata Morgana. I promise, it's not Fat Morgan. So it looks like our spawns are in the top left and the top right. We have Nablime as the snow, Terran against Veek as the Palatinate blue, Protoss. And interestingly enough, Veek signed up as Protoss, but he initially wanted to play random or maybe just Terran because he was feeling like, oh yeah, I like Terran, I like Bio and all this other stuff. He decides to switch over to Protoss, which is funny because I think he signed up the same day that I buffed Bio, <laughs> which is like one of his preferred styles. So it's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny that he ended up picking Protoss. And I guess technically he still has time to change that, but that's what I know so far. So we're actually going to get a little bit of interesting practice uh, taking a look at here. I'm also trying to clock the map. I guess we can reveal the map and take a look at it. So it looks like uh, you've got a very spacious main, fairly high distance for travel to the natural, so that could be a problem versus air, but at the very least they're on like the same sort of horizontal axis, so when you're thinking about it in those terms it seems okay. Uh, one thing I would worry about is how far away the drop zones are, but at the very least you can just put like a watchdog here and a watchdog here and then you're kind of done. Uh, whereas some other maps, the uh, drop zones are actually closer to the resources, which can be a little bit of a problem. Uh, so that seems to be insulated against here. Uh, obviously, this area here is like kind of a drop zone or whatever. We do have the uh, big big bridge, and it looks like maybe we need to extend some tiles at some point to make that tile a little bit better. Uh, not Veek's fault, though, as far as I know. We've got, uh, looks like, eight minerals, double gas in the dead center of the map. We have some interesting-looking bases on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and we have a repeat of the uh, dead center middle uh, in the exact six o'clock location. So it's kind of interesting, right? Because you could take this third to be closer, and maybe you wouldn't want to take this as your fourth though, but if you take this as your third, then you have to go all the way across a bridge and up a ramp. I don't know, I like the big I like the big bridges overall. I think that's a, that's gonna be very interesting. So we'll take that off and, and see what's going on. It looks like, yeah, Nablime was actually taking the uh, round way around, the long way around. Uh, I'm not sure if he thought it was like XY initially and then realized, oh wait, it's not, and then decided to scout his opponent. We have a gateway coming with Zealots on the way. There was a second one queued up, but it looks like that's going to get canceled, and he's just going to do a one-gate Zealot expand. Kind of interesting. We haven't seen that style before. I mean, we've seen one-gate expand all, the, all over the place, but uh, was it really something that uh, we were expecting to see when it comes to the Zealot first? I'm not sure about that. And since I have revealed the map and then unrevealed the map, it hides the resources, so we don't get to see those anymore. But that's okay. We'll see those in future games. The Mason continuing to scout just to be a bother. Looks like he's on his way home now. We have a Harakin and a Mason guarding the front line. Very unlikely that the Zealot can do much of anything at this point. And actually, yeah, I'm looking at this, and, and the distance to travel seems pretty intense, uh, which is kind of interesting to think about. There is obviously this, like, bridge path here and this unbuildable terrain, which is kind of neat. Uh, we could see that obviously be, like, the... Yeah, I would think that would be the shorter path, but, like, the units automatically took the other one. So I guess it's probably, like, not that much of a difference. So, uh, double Ahmed here for Nablime. He's going to go ahead and stim on down and pick off the Zealot, or at least do it his best to do so, but then he didn't really follow it, so a little bit awkward. Uh, this is, of course, before I increase the movement speed of Maverick, so uh, that is going to be a little bit different there, and the Zealot will manage to escape. The Mason will finally die, but not before getting... It could have gotten deeper into the base, uh, you know, wriggling away from that... Hierophant, since Veek wasn't paying too much attention to it, and had he gotten deeper into the base, he might have been able to scout something more useful, uh, so it's a little bit awkward there, but that's something that Veek can tidy up later on. You know, we're not really at the stage where we can necessarily criticize players for doing such minor things. Meanwhile, we have a Fulcrum added behind this Ministry, so Nablime, true to his form, is not going to be behind in terms of uh, workers or anything like that. Just had to uh, pause the recording to prevent us from getting sirened to death, and I'm not talking about the Terran bio unit, but maybe we'll see that later. All right, expansion's established. I can actually use more than just two camera hotkeys. Isn't that lovely? Actually, I've been trying to uh, remind myself to like not well, sort of do what I just did there, where I just like very, very fastly switch, you know, very swiftly switch over into do two different locations or whatever. Um, trying to trying to be a little bit more elegant with it, but uh, my my. 
in like if I'm just watching the replay and I'm not actually casting it, um, or I'm like looking at it and it's like late at night and I'm not casting anything, I'm just sort of like observing uh, a match between two pl players. I'm fucking moving all over the place, dude. It's nauseating for people who are watching. You can ask Lolo Skates about that. We do have some custom tiles here. The uh, sand dunes don't normally blend with this, so that's a neat little touch, although he does uh, subject us to some mirrored tiles over here at the crags. The crags are really dumb because uh, they are on they only have two possible tiles. It's kind of like grass in the ice tile set. It's very, very annoying. And uh, I guess technically it's also like the flagstones on the twilight tile set. The problem is... Flagstones didn't, by default, have their extra uh, variants mirrored. So, normally you would have four variants for either side, which is still not very much. But instead you have two. Um, but they can't be, like, lard mirrored in the same way. Zealot is uh, body blocking this vulture as best it can. There's some micro happening over here. I I mean, I don't think I need to tell you guys that that's not too consequential. A Hurakan Maverick and a Cyprian, as well as a Lobotomy Mine, is going to result in two of these Zealots getting absolutely slapped. And more of them are even baited in on top of that Cyprian. That was very, very brutal as far as, uh, you know, a trap or whatever is sprung. Uh, unfortunately, there was just no re <laughs> reaction from the blind because he's still kiting this Zealot in the middle of the map. Oh, what a goober. Absolutely, Goober. Well, at the very least, he's um, caused Veek some tickling. And he has another vulture he can lay some more mines at. Oh my god, he's got idle masons! No, never mind. I did appreciate that Nablime said recently that when he was playing versus 3 Crow on Infinite Velocity in the quarterfinals of Ascension number 7, or uh, number 6, uh, he said. What did he say? He said, I got up to over 250 masons. I have a problem. <laughs> Something like that. I didn't even notice that count. So, okay, we've got the tr three gate, you know, initial setup for the contain, and, and we immediately have the Argosy on the way. I think this is this is a mixed bag as far as, like, when this match was played. I think this was played about a week ago. So some of the changes to Solarians may have been in, and some of them may not have been in. Oh, here we go. Frontlining immediately into the lobotomy mine. That's absolutely not what you want to do. But Nablime is also being a little bit lackluster with his response. And look at that. A lobotomy mine just seeker, hunter seekers out and stuns the three of the striders. Obviously, this is still doing a pretty good job as far as Veek is concerned because he's kind of like pressuring for some kind of anti-ground uh, focus, right? And look at this. There was enough gas to tech up, but instead another stockade is happening. So as long as he's delaying the stockade, He's in a pretty good spot here. He could keep the ant seal over to see what is being made in that Argosy, uh, but he decides not to. So in, in CMBW, when you have detection on a structure, you can click on that structure, and you will see the production queue just like a witness or just like that player. So he could have kept that ant seal over there and seen, okay, it's a Solarian coming, and just to confirm. Because you could build an Argosy and then force a ridiculous reaction from the Terran, and then, you know, as a result... Uh, go for like Magisters or some other support unit uh, or even like a Didact potentially and then they've got like, these units I mean, I guess, you know, in theory if you get Sundogs or something It's still useful for a couple of other reasons But I would just worry about like, you know, is my opponent trying to brain me? But Solarians are a good choice. Veek also taking a Nexus in the other side of the map Making sure to set himself up for a third base out expanding the Terran We've seen this time and time again in Starcraft 1 normally, so it's a, still a thing that you want to do, generally speaking. I, I Honestly, V could have done it a bit sooner, but he is going to go for the Solarians, the uh, new name for the carrier for those who are still new. And this is interesting. So the Solarian will finish, and it's going to waypoint towards the middle of the map, slightly biased to the left, where his front is. But as it leaves, the drop is going to arrive. Will the Solarian turn around? It looks like he's going to try to break down the Argosy with this Harakan drop. I think he could have done a lot of economic damage as well, uh, because it's really unlikely that he's going to be able to... Oh, oh the Solarian got a little bit tickled. The uh, Anseal can do a little bit to protect this. In fact, I think it actually is going to kill the Argosy. That's really good. Now, meanwhile, the front has been totally broken. And so now Veek is stuck on just the one Solarian. And it looks like the Anseal is also not going to escape. Uh, so he traded, you know, a lot of pressure on the front where he said to pull all the boys and there's so many striders and there's not, you know, six, seven extra Harakins and a cleric over here to help with the front that, you know, V kind of sensed weakness in the water. He realized, wait, you're going to drop me. You're going to use your Anseal. You're going to use all these resources or you might kill my Argosy. But I still got one Solarian out. 
and you really are going to have a hard time holding. The Anseal charging forward, I don't know about that one, but at least it does protect some Hurakans. And the Sentinels are up now. It's going to be a lot harder for Veek to be able to push this through, but he does want to stick around and kill this Ministry if he can. One of the Sentinels has lifted off to try to move a little bit closer so that it can support the front and maybe save that Ministry. Just barely going to be able to escape without entering into the red, and there were a bunch of Masons that were pulled to begin with. Now, unfortunately, there was an utter massacre of workers. And again, there is still that one Solarian. I'm actually wondering where it is. Okay, it was kind of idling over here. So it's going to go ahead and start attacking. You can see here that it's, uh, I think its weapon range is actually, or its launch range is not actually adjusted. But uh, it's hard to remember because it's only two range difference, so it's not immediately visible. Uh, but yeah, it looks like there's enough Goliaths and uh, Watchdogs that, for whatever reason, uh, there's not really going to be a, a move to uh, have Veek... Go for that. He actually made another Argosy, this time at his third, and he's adding so many more gates, because he was floating a lot of money during this. That's that's kind of the problem, is I don't know if Nablime actually clocked that this base existed, but <laughs> there's enough resources for Veek to build two more Argosies, and he's already starting another Solaria. Now, there is a potential for a Hurakan drop, so that could still cause some issues, because there is no defense at this base, but I don't know if Nablime noticed it, right? We all know that Nablime loves himself some uh, opportunities, right, to... Uh, to drop and, and, and such, and he's only now going to be leaving and, and moving into that direction. The uh, Sentinels have uh, done a lot of damage to the ground army of Veek, but he's got like six gates now. And again, I, it just feels like with Nablime not really not really being in a good position here, he's, uh, he's gonna unload the Hurakans, presumably, but he's just gonna find some gateways. That's not really the prime target. He could have like unpowered the pylon over here if, if he had known about it, and then maybe forced some cancels or something like that. So he, de he depowers one of the gates. He's going to depower the other set, the all of them. That's an Artosis pylon for sure. And, uh, you know, that's going to be somewhat big. But at, at back at home, he's got an Anseal with very limited energy. He's got Goliaths and Sentinels, but he only has the two. And now the Solarian can focus it down. Yeah, it looks like there was actually three. The uh, ground army is all but done, but there still is the Solarian. Now there's a Valkyrie that was queued up by mistake. Uh, one of the Solarians that spawned back at home came over here to try to figure this out, but it looks like it is going to be GG called, and Veek will... I would... Honestly, that did not look as convincing as maybe it should have, considering the tech and economic advantage that Veek had, but I'll say uh, he was able to eventually close the gap versus Nablime, who, uh, you know, maybe we can chalk it up to, hey brother, you were playing on a map for the first time, you had no idea what was going on, uh, the Solarian rush kind of bopped you. One thing that I've noticed is that a lot of our Terran players, when they, or like maybe Mr. Emi was playing random in this tournament when he plays his Terran, he's, you know, a lot of them end up not really being super pressure oriented early on. Maybe they feel like they can't be pressure oriented. Maybe they feel like their units aren't good enough to be pressure oriented or whatever. Uh, but there's usually like a flow to the game where if you have something like what Nablime had, where you have the vultures and you have the ability to like kind of push out and push back the gate army because it's not going to be as strong as like a combined arms mech bio army or even just a full on mech army, depending on if you end up adding scrapyards to the mix, then at that stage, right, you can conceivably push the Protoss back and force them to spend more of their resources on things other than tech. You can kind of think about it in the same way that when you're fighting Zerg, you don't want the Zerg to be able to spend all of their larva on workers, so you have to pressure them, and that forces some of their workers to turn into defense and some of their larva to turn into military. And the more you can do that, the less the Zerg will be able to get ahead. And one, one of the things that we're observing right now is that a lot of Terrans just say, oh, I'm going to get pressured early on by either superior quantities of units or superior quality of units in terms of the Protoss being the qualitative one. So then they just end up fighting this lost battle where they're, they're trying to turtle and see if they can rush up the tech tree. And you can maybe do that, but I feel like if your opponent does the same thing, then they actually have more tempo, more map control, more comfort. And the only real thing that you can do is drop them to make it up for that. So drops should be a thing that you use, but I kind of feel like they're much more powerful if you already have some presence on the map, if you already have some sort of push forward. So it's going to be interesting to see that, but uh, let's just see what happens in the next game, and I'll shut my trap, cast your stop talk, etc., etc. Just something that I thought was worth pointing out, because I feel like Terrans who turtle often get bopped. Hello, hello, we are back with Veek versus Nablime. The spawns are different now, the colors are different now. It's Glacial against Ultramarine. The latter being the Terran in the top right by Nablime. So, uh, if we take another look at the map's layout here, thanks to the Quasi-Fog feature that Veek himself added, uh, we can see the resources, because I'm not going to undo that. 
And uh, we have a stockade going down in a interesting location. He's actually cutting workers for this. Is he going to float this all the way across the map? I think he might. I think he might. And uh, honestly, this could be a really fast GG either way. Okay, very interesting situation here because Nablime is just a cheeky son of a gun. Dude, he's, he's a... I like how when Mesk always calls him a Kiwi. I don't know if Mesk is aware that Kiwis are a different thing than Aussies, but that's okay. <laughs> he's a... Uh, it is funny. I remember uh, I had a, a couple run-ins with, uh, with Australian and New Zealander people. And like... The Aussies hated bogans, or they hated the term bogan. Oh my god, it's a forward gate. It's a forward gate versus a forward stockade. Anyway, the Aussies think that bogans are are annoying, but the Kiwis think that bogans are hot. That's what I was told by numerous people from both sides. It's a forward lattice, actually, so that's interesting. Maybe Nablon can confirm my dating theory as he's putting a second stockade at his ramp. Honestly, I feel like this is going to take long enough to hit that it really won't be that big of a deal. Uh, some Vespina is being harvested. I wonder if that was a mistake or... No, no, no. Yeah, he's, he's actually just straight up doing it with one guy. So he could be going for, like, um, you know, adding a Cyprian uh, to the mix. He's landing, I think, with almost enough space to construct a Vestry, but not quite enough. Onk. By the way, that's how it looks when you land on the very top strip, because lard... No, he can actually fit a Vestry there, too, so that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, we'll see if that ever gets scouted. I feel like the answer is no, but some Achmeds will charge in, and because Veek has chosen to proxy his lattice, he has nothing at home. Now, if the Mason arrives to scout, which is going to look normal-ish, even though it's a little late, um, then one of the things that you're just going to end up seeing is... Oh. Wait, he put it pretty close. Veek. Oh, never mind. The pathing worked out in his favor. I was going to say, he put it pretty close to that ramp. If the, if the worker comes down towards the bottom, he's just going to see that. Anyway, yeah, there's nothing over here at home. So <laughs> the mason's just going to start building an anchor or something, and then you're really boned. Uh, meanwhile, obviously, Terrans can just... Uh, we have a simulacrum coming, so that could be interesting. But, you know, there's a Cyprian on the way as well. The Terrans can start to attack uh, the scribe. And then they'll start to attack the Simulacrum, and it will start to split. So uh, when Sims take hull damage, they split, inheriting their HP at the time. Uh, looks like some attempt at uh, Micro is happening here, but Veek is blocking his own Sim. So this is going to be a little bit dangerous. Some boys are pulled. Meanwhile, Ahmed is in the mineral line for Veek. And uh, this is a very different game to what we saw in the past. Now, the Sims could get Runaway over here. There's only the one Maverick. There's more units being trained. Cyprian was cut off in the meantime. But yeah, Veek is in a really, really rough spot. He never evacuated his scribes. He's now going to try to do so. But if he loses his Nexus, it's really only got that one outpost in the middle of the map. He doesn't have enough money to actually do anything. And the Masons are body blocking enough as an anchor is going down. If that anchor finishes, there is zero hope for Veek. He's going to go for the Maverick, and he will get it. Right now, he's actually getting a couple extra DPS bits because of the uh, the Masons automatically acquiring targets. And the Harakan is just spinning around these guys. He can't seem to figure out how to get out of here. Oh my god, the Sims are increasing in quantity. The Nexus has been torn asunder, and there's almost no resources left. But hey, 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 hey you, you don't have enough money to repair anymore. All right, the Anchor is put up. Now he needs to defend his Lattice from, uh, you know the situation that he's in, because otherwise Ahmed will just pop in here, depower the pylons, and and run away. Hey, he's even on attack move. Now, one Ahmed attack is not going to be enough to make the Simulacra uh, get bopped. He is going to go ahead and try to charge the ramp. There is only the Cyprian, right? He has started mining a little bit, but he's not got a unit coming out of that stockade, so he's just trying to repair. The Scribe's doing a lot of damage here. This is still a very, very tense game, and the Cyprian is actually going to get bopped inside, right? Meanwhile, the Harakan's desperately looking around for the- where could it be? It's almost like I walked past two lattices coming up, now I'm gonna lift my structures, and of course, I don't think that the Sims are gonna be able to win this one, but it all depends. If they can- they can force a stalemate if they kill off the, the military. There is also still a Mason with this army, so the blind can rebuild. He finally discovers the location. I mean, depowering it doesn't really matter, but, you know. In this case, yeah, I don't think the... I think that we, we've reached a stalemate, boys. <laughs> yeah, he could have just landed somewhere and then used his uh, his mason. He GG's out, but my my guy... Yeah, you know what that is? That's uh, nobody knowing how to deal with Simulacra. That's what that is. Well, that was a funny way to close out that, that match. That was a, a pretty good one. All right, well, we do have a third replay, uh, but 
We're already at the rough time that I want to try to experiment with these videos for. I was thinking I do like a video that's around 20 minutes, a video that's around like 30 minutes again later on, and just to see what's going on. Because sometimes I'll do a video, it'll get like 500 views. And I'll be like, why though? And something that I've, so I'm sort of forming theories and trying to test that. I think it's something to do with the video length. We want to get more people into CMBW, so hopefully y'all understand. But there is, a, there is a third match, so at some point we'll take a look at that. Maybe you can stay tuned for that tomorrow, or maybe it'll be something else tomorrow. Nobody knows around here, but uh, it'll be good. It'll, it'll be a good time. GG's.